Amen. Amen. And um, hey, how many of you enjoyed having John Edwards here last week? Was that good? Um, if you missed it, you can go get it online. He had some uh, important things to share. And um, I told you at the end of the service, I, I said, and I, I give you my word, I said nothing to him. Because, in fact, the very first thing he said to me when I saw him, he said, don't tell me anything. I said, okay. He said, don't tell me anything. He said, I don't go online uh, on social media and look at a church before I go because I don't, I don't feel like that would be right. So I don't know anything, but I, I, the Lord spoke to him, he said. Um, and I feel like what he said was right along with, with where we've been going, isn't it? Um, talking about our vision and, and the future. And um, I, I, after the service said a couple things to him. I said, well, can I share you the vision now? And he said, yeah. And so I told him the vision. He said, he said I already knew um, because the Lord told me, but he said, I didn't feel released to say the details because uh, I didn't know how much you had shared with the church. But the Lord already told me all of the stuff I shared with him. And there's some, there's some things he said about it. I'll share that with you after the service, but um, at, the, at the meeting. And I hope you can come to the meeting we're having directly after service. We'll have pizza. I promise it won't be too long. I just want to share some details with you, the plan. I want to give you the plan. Does that sound good? Um, so anyway, um, I, I, want to, I want to continue with this topic of vision. I'm going to finish it up today, okay? But I want to speak about vision one more time. I want you to hear it. And I, I was reading a story about uh, a man who, when he was little, played Little League Baseball, right? Anybody play Little League Baseball when they were little? This guy played on a Little League team Back, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, he was on the team. And he said, I still remember that very first day, the very first practice, because we went to the practice and the coach looked at us and he said, how many of you have a dream one day of playing in the major leagues? And, and he said, every kid's hand went up, right? Every kid, I dream of playing in the major leagues. And the coach said, well, your dream starts today. Let's go practice, right? He used it for a motivation to get them, like, looking to the future. You see what vision does. It gets me looking to the future of some possibility that God could do in my life. And he says, so now let's take that motivation and go practice today like you're getting ready for your future. And he said years later, after he had grown up 25, 30 years later, he was coaching his own little league team that his son was on. And and he said he, he remembered that speech and how inspirational it was when the coach said that to him. So he said, I'm going to do the same thing. And he went to that group of kids. Now 30 years have gone by. He went to the group of kids. How many of you dream of playing in the major leagues one day? It's, it was like this room, crickets. <laughs> Nobody put their hand up. And he said, come on, anybody have a dream of one day? Put no, nobody, no kid put their hands up. He was shocked. How do you motivate a kid with no dreams? Yeah. He wondered what happened in those 30 years to steal the dreams. What convinced them they could never be more than they were right now? You know, I think we talk about the vision that God has for your life. A lot of people might struggle because they can't imagine something big. Right? We've been talking about that scripture. You can put that scripture up, uh, 1 Corinthians 2. But maybe situations, problems, circumstances, something in life has stolen a dream. Right? Uh, I pray that as we've been speaking about this over the last several weeks, and even as you heard John Edwards didn't even know what the direction we're talking about is, but he, the Lord gave him the similar word about, about direction and vision. But I pray that the Lord has been reviving some things in your spirit. Amen speaking some visions, speaking some dreams over you. And one more time, look at verse 9 in 1 Corinthians 2. It says, this is what the scriptures mean when they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Verse 10, but it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit, for his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets and in verse 12, he says, and we've received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. So you've heard all this before, and I'm going to say it one more time, that God has big things planned for your life, but it's up to you to start receiving his word, 
by the Holy Spirit. It's up to you to start acting on what he speaks over you. It's time to start believing that you could be something more, that you could do something more, something that's bigger than you. Because what it means is it's God working through you. It's not you doing it. And I think that's what we have to come to terms with because we look so often at what I can do, right? My limitations. But it's not about me. It's about him working through me. Amen? So we need to start dreaming. I want to go here this morning and, and continue with that. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. In verse 18, look what it says. You know this, this prayer that Paul prayed over the Ephesian church. He said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Okay, the eyes of your heart, that's, your na that's, not, that's not your natural eyes, okay? He's not talking about your natural eyeballs be enlightened. He says the eyes of your heart uh, or, or your inner man, your spirit, your spirit eyes. Your spirit has eyes, okay? And he says, I pray they would be open, be enlightened, so you can know the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, of, his, of the inheritance among the saints, and what is the boundless greatness of his power toward us who believe. But he says, in order to see what God can do in your life, you need to have your eyes opened. And I think what a lot of people need is just to have their eyes opened a little bit to what God can do through them. You got to be able to see it. Here's what I'm saying. You got to be able to see it. Paul's saying, I pray that the eyes of your spirit will be open so you can see some things, because until you see it, you'll never do it. Am I right? Before, before they can ever build a building, somebody's got to see it in here. They got to draw it out. They got to sketch it all out and, and, and draw how tall it's going to be and draw dimensions and things. Otherwise, you get people doing different things. And one guy thinks the wall should be this long and the other guy thinks it should be twice as long. And you got weird stuff happening because nobody can see it. You got to be able to see it. And it's the same thing with your life. God wants you to be able to see what he's doing. He wants you to be able to see it so you can do it, but you're going to have to have your eyes open. And I believe God has things for your life that he wants your eyes open to. I believe, listen, that he has things for our church that he wants your eyes open to. I shared about the, the vision that God has for us to build a multi-site, but I also shared about a vision that God has for us right here in this moment. Do you remember that? Put that slide up again. We have a, a vision statement slide. And I want you to see this. I think you have it somewhere, if you can find it. But I'll read it to you. We are a church where you will experience belonging. I want to talk about these things for a few moments because I want you to be able to see it. Because unless you can see it, we'll never do it. And if all it is is just a nice thing that we can put on a wall and it doesn't mean anything to us, we'll never do it. But here's the thing. I feel like God's called our church at this hour to be the church, you know? I, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of going to church. I want to be the church. I don't think God's looking for more people to go to church. Let's start being the church so we can change some things in this city, amen. Change some things in the world. And so what I believe is we're a place where you will experience belonging, where you will discover the love of God, where you will be empowered for the purpose that God has for your life and you will impact the world for Jesus Christ. Amen. I believe that that's what God wants to do in our lives and in this church. And um, see, you got to know where you're going. You got to be able to see it. You got to have a roadmap to know how to get to some place. And I believe this is what God wants us, where God wants us heading. You know, so let me talk about this for a minute. Just leave that slide up there because I, I want us to catch it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit these four, these four things for the next few minutes. I'm going to give you why they're important, what God wants to see in us. Because, again, I don't think this is just, this isn't just a, a nice saying. It's something we need to live out. And he says, it says here, you will experience belonging. Let me talk about that. Did you know you're part of a family? Amen. When you're born again, you don't join a club. When, when you're born again, you don't join a church. When you're born again, you get born into a family. The first time you were born in the natural, your mom didn't say, welcome to the, to the social club. No, it's welcome to the family. You're part of a family. And with being a part of a family, there comes certain privileges. There also comes certain responsibilities. 
as you grow and mature. Is, didn't anybody grow up in a house where you had responsibility? That's a good thing, am I right? Hey, you learn how to cut the grass now. You get some responsibility. I love it. I love having five kids. It's going to be fantastic one day. <laughs> um, in 1 Peter 3, look what it says here in the Living Bible, if you have that translation up there. It's, I'll read it. It is his boundless mercy that has given us the privilege of being born again so that we are now members of God's own family. See, listen, when you're born again, you're born into a family. And, and I hear this all the time because when people come, John Edwards and, and different people come into this church, guest speakers that we have over the, over the last several years, they come in, they say, this is a special place. This is something special is in here. They say the presence of God is in here. They say people are so friendly. What is wrong with people? Uh, we've, had, we've had people come in and think uh, something's wrong with these people because why are they being so nice to me? I don't understand it. Because, that's because be, you, guys are, you guys are getting this. Amen? See, we're supposed to be not just a, hey, welcome to our club. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. This is a family. We come from different backgrounds. We might have, we might have different hair color. You might have hair. Maybe you don't. Maybe you got different skin color. Maybe you got a different language you speak. It doesn't matter. See, we're all part of the same family. Okay? Some people say, some people say, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. You, you know what you are? You're an orphan. You're supposed to be in a family. Look, look what it says in Ephesians 4, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head of Christ. From him, that's from Christ, the whole body. Okay, he's the head, you're the body. You got that? And from him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, ligament promotes the growth of the body for, the building, for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. Let me break it down. He's saying every part of this body has a function, okay? And in fact, every part of the body, he talks about ligaments and things that hold the body together. You know, you have a job as the body of Christ to hold each other up, to lift each other, to support one another, to build each other up. And if I try to do it all by myself, I wind up a mess. If you don't come to church, we're missing part of the body. And that gift that God's given you in the church to lift people up, to build each other up, to use a spiritual gift, it's missing. See, we need to be part of a body. And I don't know if you've ever been in a place in your life where it feels like life's falling apart. You need to be there to lift each other up. Amen. Maybe you're there. Maybe you've been there. I've been there. We need to be able to lift each other up. Amen. We're here to support one another. See, listen, there's a world out there that's falling apart. You walk through those doors and you see a world that's falling apart. And I'll tell you, the only place the world's not falling apart is in the church. We need to be the thing that supports the people in our world. Hey, we want to show them the love of God. We want to show them what a real family looks like because all they've ever seen their whole lives is a dysfunctional family. They've grown up in dysfunctional homes, broken homes. They don't know what, they don't know what a real family looks like. This is what I'm talking about, belonging. We need to show what it means to belong to a family. Show the world what it means to, to care for one another, to lift each other up. I think some people need to change the way they see church. You know, most, a lot of people come and they think, what can I get out of this, right? What am I going to get out of today's service? What am I going to get out of the message? What am I going to get out of worship? But we have to recognize something. What if, what if we recognize it's not about us? It's about each other. It's about him, you know? And instead, we should participate in church in order to change lives, like a family, because not everybody who comes in here is going to be a believer, but I'll tell you what we've found is that this generation wants to experience belonging before they'll experience believing. Before they'll step into believing about God, they want to see that you love them, that you care about them. 
that you accept them. I'm not talking about accepting sin, accepting things that they do, but here's, here's the thing. When you come in, you gotta recognize not everybody's perfect, but God is in the process of changing us, amen. So we wanna be purposeful about giving opportunities to belong. One of the things we, we have in here, and I wanna brag on some people for a minute, our hospitality team, our greeters, thank you so much for what you do. Um, you guys do an incredible job um, every week, showing up early, loving on people, sharing the love of God. See, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. We had a meeting last week, or two weeks ago, I think, for, for ushers and greeters. And one of them came up to me and told me afterward, they said, I'm so thankful that we had that. Because you know what it tells me? It tells me that we're preparing for more people to come into this place. We're preparing for souls to come into the kingdom of God. Hey, that's somebody who gets it. That's someone who understands what's going on. So thank you so much. Life groups, thank you to you life group leaders. You guys are doing a fantastic job. I want to I wanna brag on you guys for a second because you're, you're doing it. You're helping people feel like there's a place to belong. You know, we've had uh, as many as 70 people up there, something like that, over the last several Wednesday nights. And I thank you for you guys that have been faithful to serve in that area. It's so amazing. Our community meals. See, we're doing these things. We're already doing these things, but I want you to understand why. Why do we, why do we have a community meal to show the community uh, that there's a place they can belong? Why do we have life groups to show there's a place you can belong and do life together? Why do we have greeters and ushers if... Listen, the point is to show people belonging, and so we thank you for that. The second part of our vision, a place where you will discover the love of God. Look at 1 John chapter 4. You know this scripture. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we may have eternal life through him. See, that's what we're all about is experiencing and demonstrating the love of God, okay? When you, when you come into this place, we want you to experience the love of God. We want people sharing the love of God with you. And it's, it tells you something. It's a sign that someone is born again when they love that should be the sign. Look at what Jesus said, John 13. I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. So we're called to love, but the problem is, here, here's the thing. Sometimes we don't feel like it. Am I right? Sometimes we, we're okay loving certain people and other people, we see them and we turn around and walk the other way. We don't want to demonstrate the love of God. Sometimes someone hurts us. Let's talk about our own lives. Sometimes someone hurts us and what happens? The love stops. I don't love them anymore because they don't deserve it. Isn't that what we're saying? You know, sometimes, let me use couples, husbands and wives as an example for a minute. A husband says something hurtful. The wife gets hurt. The wife refuses to fix dinner for him or something. And the husband's now, he's mad. So he says something else hurtful. Now the wife does something, and it's, you see the cycle. It's a cycle of hurt. And the source, there's a root source. The root source is pride. I refuse to bow. I refuse to give something to that person because they don't deserve it. So the marriage enters a cycle of bitterness, anger, frustration, unforgiveness. Even though the word of God says we're supposed to love, the love isn't working. So how do you fix it, right? How do you, how do you love someone you're mad at? That's a good question, right? How do you love someone who hurts you? How do you love someone when you don't feel like it? And I think the problem is we don't really understand love. Um, love's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It says God is love, doesn't it? God is love. God demonstrated his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8, right? So God is love, and so he demonstrated love. Everything he does is love. 
So he put love in you. If you've got, if you're born again and you're part of a family, you're part of the family of love. You've got love in you. The choice is not, do I love someone or not? The choice is, will I demonstrate the love? Will I act on the love? I read this story about a woman. She wanted to divorce her husband. She was so mad and he'd done some things and she was frustrated with him and she just couldn't stand him anymore. She got to where she just hated the sight of him. She went to an attorney secretly and she said, I want to I wanna file divorce papers. And he said, okay. And he, she said, no, you don't understand that. I want, I want this to hurt. I want him to suffer. I want, I want him to... I want to put him through the same kind of torment that he's done to me. And lawyers are good at that. They'll, he said, I know what to do. Okay. He said, he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home. And for the next month, I want you to treat him like he is a king. I want you to do everything for him. I want you to serve him. I want you to be kind to him. I want you to just, just gush over him. And at the end of the month, we'll serve him the divorce papers. It'll just, it'll just blindside him knock him for a loop, and so she did. She went home, and a month went by. The lawyer didn't hear anything. Two months went by, three months went by. Finally, he thought, what is wrong with this woman? He called her. He said, I got the divorce papers ready for you. She said, I don't need, I don't need those anymore. He said, what do you mean? She said, I went home, and I started acting like I loved my husband, and in the, some, somewhere I began to actually love him. Here's the trick, okay? Your feelings, your emotions will always follow the actions. As you begin to demonstrate love, love will come. Because God is love. He put love inside you. So how do I love people? I make a choice to love. What we want people to experience when they come to this church is the love of God. That's what we're all about. We want him, them to experience his love as they're in his presence, as they worship, but also through you. You are the carriers of the love of God. Amen. Let me keep going. We want you this to be a place where you will experience belonging, discover the love of God, but also be empowered. I feel like this is so important, be empowered to live out the purpose that God has for your life. That's why we talk about things like the vision that God has for you, because we believe God has a plan for you, right? Jeremiah 29, 11, we quote it every year when someone graduates from high school, but it's the truth. It's not just for high school graduates, it's for every one of us in the room. We, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, right? Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, give you a hope and a future. God has a hope and a future for you. He's got a plan for you. And our job here is to help empower you to live out that plan, to live out that purpose. I believe there's people in this room, you have potential in your life to change the world. Potential. I'm not talking about changing your workplace, that's good, we need that. But I'm talking about there's people in here that you've got potential to completely tur turn the world upside down like the disciples did in the book of Acts. God has put great potential in you and it's our job to help you discover that and draw it out of you, amen? But you need to be empowered to live that kind of life. Look what it says in Acts 1.8. You'll receive power when what? The Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. See, I believe that's why you're in this church. I don't believe you're here on accident, okay? I believe God puts you here in this church for such a time as this because he wants to empower you to live, come on, the kind of life that he's called you to live. He doesn't want you living powerless, amen. He doesn't want you struggling through life. This is one of my greatest pet peeves. I don't believe God wants you struggling through life, barely making it. I believe he called you to live above yeah. situations, circumstances. Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't get bothered when there was a storm. He rose above it. He spoke to it, didn't he? He walked on top of the water. He didn't get frustrated with the things of life. And I believe God's called you to live above some things in your life that might come against you. See, look what it says in John 10, verse 10. A thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. You've heard this before, haven't you? I've come so that they may have life and have it how? In abundance. In abundance. God has something better for you, and our job is to help you recognize that and live above it. He wants you living a full life, a life full of purpose. And listen, if life has been getting you down, come on, recognize something. Jesus came to take you up. Above situations and circumstances, above whatever the enemy could think of, 
above whatever life can throw at you. That's why we teach the things we do in here. That's why we want you recognizing that God has something better for you. Um, so it's, it's my vision that if you've been coming here for any amount of time, you'd learn how to live above. Learn how to walk out the purpose that God has for you. And so I'm, I'm talking about people who are walking by faith, not by sight. Come on. I'm talking about people who are called out, who aren't ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm talking about people who are hearing from the Holy Spirit and following his plans that God has for them. Amen. And, and finally, the last thing up here, and I believe you will impact the world for Jesus Christ. See, what we have in here isn't just for us, is it? It's got to be for the world. If, that's, if it's all it is, just take us to heaven now. We don't, have to, we don't have to go a few more weary days and then we'll just fly away. Am I right? But I believe God puts you here and he's empowered you with purpose so that you can impact the world for Jesus Christ. We, we spoke recently, um, several months ago, about the word go. Do you remember that? Maybe not, but we spoke about the word go and the fact that, that God's called us to go into all the world. Jesus said, in, in, um, Jesus said, the one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flowing from deep within him. See, what is inside you has got to come out. If it just stays in you, you're, you become like a dead sea, right? You become stagnant water, and stagnant water is not good for anything. You don't want to give it to your animals. It'd be no good. It makes make them sick. You don't want stagnant. It's got to be flowing. What God has put in you has got to flow. And I think the problem with some people is they refuse to let go of what God's given them. They don't, they, maybe they're afraid, and they don't know how to step out. Maybe they're they're, uh, they're, they like what they have and they just want to keep what they have and they're comfortable. God doesn't want you comfortable. He wants your river flowing. And I'll tell you what, some of the most uncomfortable things in the world are when God starts flowing through you at first. I remember being so many times being uncomfortable, saying things that I think, Lord, why am I saying that? That's not, that's too big. I shouldn't say that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel embarrassed or I'm going to get in trouble or someone's going to get mad, but I say it anyway because I feel like the Lord is telling me. And you've got, to let the, you've got to let the river flow. Don't stop him up. Don't stop him up. I've told you about the time where I was praying for a, a man. They said, he's going to die. Would you pray for him and do like his, you know, final goodbye? And I, I walked in the room. It was in Puerto Rico. And I, I didn't know what to say. I've never done that before. And I, I, don't, I don't usually just pray for people to die, you know. But I walked in and, and the Holy Spirit came on me. I started saying some stuff. And I thought, oh, man, uh, this is bad. But, but they had to interpret it, so at least I thought, well, maybe it'll get lost in interpretation, and I'll just, I'll just speak it over this man. And I, I was saying things like, you're going to get up, you're going to enjoy time with your family, you're going to, you're, all these different things, you're going to be able to eat, because he couldn't, he was just, he was comatose, he was laying, laying there flat. They called me like four days later and said he died, and I said, okay. And they said, but first, he woke up, and he had his meal, and he enjoyed his family, he spent time, and his several days just spent, like, enjoying life, and then he died. And I thought, wow, okay, so you, sometimes it's uncomfortable to keep things, but God doesn't want you keeping things. He wants the river flowing. Amen. Jesus said in, in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded. And remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So listen, what does go mean for you? It might mean going to your neighbor, right? Right? Sometimes that's the most uncomfortable mission field you're going to find because you got to see that guy again tomorrow. Am I right? Um, you send me somewhere where I don't know anybody and I'll never see him again. That's fine. I don't want to go to my neighbor. But, some, but God might be calling you, come on, to go to your neighbor, your, your workplace. Um, and some of you, God might be calling to go to the other side of the world, but you've not been listening. So here's the thing. we got to recognize God's calling us to go. We're not called to sit in here. We're called to go out there. I, I, can't, I remember this story. I shared this story with you months ago, but I thought it was so good because we need to recognize something. What God has put in us, it, it's, it's for the people out there. And sometimes we think, well, Pastor Dave will handle that. Ozzy will handle that. John, let John Edwards go out there, but I'm comfortable here. But listen, God's called you. 
And there's a story, Billy Graham told this story about a time that he was preaching a crusade service, and uh, it was the day before he was actually scheduled to preach, his brother-in-law was preaching that night. So he went to listen to his brother-in-law preach the first service uh, the night before. And so he kind of went incognito, right? He put on a hat, he put on the sunglasses so nobody would recognize him. He sat in the back and his brother-in-law gave the altar call. And when he did, he looked and there was a man sitting near him who, who was obviously touched. And he looked over at him. He said, he said, sir, would you like to go down to receive the Lord as your savior? He said, I'd be happy to walk down with you. The man didn't know who he was. He looked at him. He said, he said, tomorrow night the big gun's coming. I think I'll wait for him. And listen, listen, there are no big guns when it, comes to, when it comes to this gospel. Come on, God's called you. Don't wait on, don't wait on some evangelist to do your job. Don't, wait on, don't let somebody else get the glory for what God wants to do through you. That's why, listen, this is why, because God has called us to go, this is why we do things like supporting missions. We've got missionaries all over this globe. You can, go, you can go on our website. We've got a terrific uh, page on our website now that has all of our missionaries listed. You can see everyone. There's tons of them. All over this world, we're supporting people. Um, that's why we're going to be organizing a missions trip for 2025. We're going to be going um, somewhere to be announced, but we're planning that. And beyond that, though, we want to rec- realize that, that you're empowered. We want you to realize this. You're empowered to take this gospel to the world. We want you to impact the world around you, wherever you are. I'm wrapping up now. So today, I'm going to close. I want you, would you do this? I want you to stand up with me. And I want to just one more time encourage you. God has a plan for your life. I hope that maybe if you're new here today that you, as you came in, you experienced some of these things that we're talking about, this belonging, discovering the love of God, your purpose that God has for you, and, and know that he's called you to impact the world. But I want to encourage you with this, and I believe this, our, it's our job to equip you for all that he has for you. I want you to see where this church is going today. But listen, it only happens when all of us say, I want to get on board. I want to get on that train. I want to, I, I recognize that, that we're going maybe a different direction than what I thought. I want to get on that train. So I want you to see where we're going. And I want to challenge you to do something. Just bow your heads and close your eyes with me for a minute. And, and I'm, going to, I'm going to recognize this. This isn't for everybody. I, I'm just going to, I'm going to present a challenge for you. And maybe there's one or two that will take this up. Maybe there's more. But I want to ask you to do something. I heard this from somebody one day, and I thought, this is so powerful. We're going we're gonna to do this. But maybe there's one or two people. Maybe there's, maybe there's a dozen people. I believe, I believe a dozen people can turn a church upside down. And I wonder if there's 12 people in here that would say, I'm going to do this. I want three, uh, three things. First of all, when you, every time you come into a service and hear a, a Sunday morning, a Wednesday night, do three things. That's all. I want you to meet someone you've never met because I believe that's how we show people belonging. Meet someone you've never met. It might be you're up in the other building on a Wednesday night and you come a few minutes early and meet some of the food bank people that are up there or uh, maybe you you go into one of the other classrooms and say hello to somebody or, or something, but you meet someone you've never met. I want you to find someone you can pray for someone comes to you and says, oh, I've got this thing going on, stop right there and pray for them. Because that's how we share the love of God with people. And I want you to find someone you can help. Maybe it would mean carrying a a bag for someone. Maybe just opening a door, maybe just doing something simple, but three things. Meet someone you've never met. Pray for someone and help someone. And I want to challenge right now, is there, is there 10 people, is there 12 people who would say, I want to do that, I want to accept that challenge? Would you raise your hand so I can see you? Thank you. Thank you. See, I believe if you get a hold of this, this can turn a church upside down. 
We start acting like the church. We start being the church. Thank you so much. I want to pray for you this morning. And you that raised your hand specifically, this is the, this is the meet, pray, help. Okay, you can remember that miles per hour, MPH. This is what's going to get us moving down the road towards our vision. Meet, pray, help. So I'm going to pray for you first of all. Lord, I thank you for these that raised their hand and said, I commit to be a leader in this church. I commit to do the work of the church that you're calling me to do, to meet people and share with them the love of God that they belong here. To pray for people because there's people that need my prayers. My prayers are powerful and effective. And Lord, I want to share the love of God that way. And Lord, to help people because Lord, there's people who need what I have. And so Lord, I thank you for these that raise their hands. Lord, that you would just bless them as they give. This is a giving. This is, this is a step into giving and, and, and giving opens the door for the blessing of God in your life. It doesn't always have to be finances. You're giving right now your time, you're giving your efforts, you're giving your thoughts and attention to someone else. And as you do, God's going to bless you. So Lord, I thank you for these that have said they'll accept that challenge. Lord, I just pray that you would just bless them in their lives and their families and their homes. Lord, everything they touch, I thank you, thank you is blessed in the name of Jesus. This morning, maybe you're here and you say, I need, I have a need in my life. I'm gonna open the altar in just a moment. I know this wasn't a, a salvation message. It wasn't a, a get healed message, but listen, if you're here today, it doesn't matter. Jesus is here. And if you're here and you need a touch from God in your life in some way, I wanna invite you to come to this altar. We want, we'll have a team that's gonna pray for you. And we begin, again, we believe our prayers are powerful and effective. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, it's good to hear about this vision, but I'm not even right with God today. My life is away from God. You're here and you want to say, I want to make my life right with him this morning, right where you are. I want you to raise your hand so I can pray for you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You just say, Lord, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins and make me a new person give you my life today, Jesus. This morning, if you need prayer for anything, I want to invite you to come to this front so we can pray together as we sing this song.